Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad you're here. Okay. <laughs> mumble, grumble, mumble. Okay, that's all right. I'm so glad I'm here. <laughs> I'm excited to share with you from God's Word this morning, as I am each week. There is so much that I want to share with you and uh, so much I must cut out with a limited time. But I want to get right on to it. I do want to tell you that I learned this morning that we need to pray for Shirley Ringler and family. Ron Ringler passed away early this morning. Uh, there will be a funeral here. I don't know when uh, because I haven't talked to Shirley about it yet. But we did lay some groundwork last week. So as I know, I'll let you know. Would you all pray with me? Father, as we look at your word, we recognize our neediness. But we know from experience that we can read it, we can study it, we can memorize it, and it may have no effect on us whatsoever. We must experience you. Father, you want to transform our lives. You want to make us changed people who are constantly changing until we die because you are preparing us to live eternity with you and what we do now will impact our eternity our faithfulness now our submission now will impact us in eternity. So Lord, our eyes are on you, our ears are on your word. Transform us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, for those who can't be here today for peace, good health. We pray for Shirley as she walks through this valley with her family. Give them peace as only you can give. And Father, I now pray that you would help me to teach. I pray that your word would go forward. It would go forth in power. I pray that your word would go forth with authority because you are God. And this is your church. We've not come to our country club this morning to get our own way, to get into our seat, to sit back and to relax. No, no. This is no country club. This is the church of the Most High God. And we come here to worship you and to love you and to love one another. And so we come here not with pride but submission. And now, Lord, I beg you, teach through me. Because you love all those who sit before me. May your word penetrate our very beings that we would leave here rejoicing that we have met with the Most High God. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Old Sven was a uh, lumberjack, a timberman who worked up in the great Northwest uh, chopping down trees uh, in the early 20th century, somewhere post uh, depression. And he was a large man who cut down more trees than any two men on any given week. He knew what he was doing and he was good at what he did. One day when he went to the little uh, hardware store in town, he noticed to get a new axe, he noticed that alongside the new axes was some other contraption that the hardware store owner told him when he asked, what is that? He said, oh, that is a chainsaw. And he said, I've never heard of one of those before. And, be and before he could say anything, the shop owner, the hardware store owner told Sven, this will multiply what you cut down now by 10. Well, with that, old Sven grabbed that signed a note that he would pay him for it and out the door he was when the shop owner had not explained a word about it to him. 
Out into the woods he went, but you know what? He came back the following week. And when he came back, he was angry. He came back and he looked at that shop owner and he said, you said this would multiply 10 times, tenfold what I've cut. It's done the opposite. I cut down one tenth this week. I don't want this. It's broken. And the shop owner looked at it and he turned it over and he turned it over again. And he looked at the blade and he looked at the motor, grabbed the rip cord and pulled it and it started up and old Sven jumped back and said, bust that noise! <laughs> You see, old Sven did not realize the power that was in his grasp. He had failed to read or listen to the instructions. And so he had power within his grasp, but he never tapped into it. He never made himself available to that power. And so it completely escaped him. You see, it's that way in a Christian's life. For those who have trusted alone and Christ alone as their Savior, there is a power resident in you. While many Christians know of it, they never make themselves available to it. They never tap into it. There lies in them, just like with Sven, if he would have listened to the instructions, there was going to be satisfaction and fulfillment in his life like he never knew before because he would be that far above the rest. For most Christians, there is a satisfaction and a fulfillment that you know nothing about. And this room is filled with those. Oh, to be sure, we understand and we can talk about it. But most never experience it on any regular plane or level or time. This morning, the subject is activating the grace of God in your life. Pay attention. This is a two-part series. You don't want to miss next week. You don't want to miss this week. The text is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. So please turn to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to talk about tapping into this power. Then the second point will be activating God's power. And the third will be putting it into action. And then next week will be the rest of it. Are you there? Let me read through the text so you get a feel for it. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Now stop right there. Remember last week, we were in verses, chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. For this reason, Paul said the same thing there that he says here. Remember we talked about it last week? For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, He's going to start his prayer in verse 1, but he gets sidetracked as he digresses and tells them about the power of God and how God has made him a minister of this mystery. Now Paul picks up again in verse 14 after his little digression. And he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. I'm going to stop right there for today. I want you to notice that first in verses 14 through 15, you need to know 
Why is this prayer here? We expect a prayer in the beginning of his letter. We expect one in the end of his letter, but we don't really expect one in the middle. The reason this prayer is here, I believe, is twofold. One, what he has just explained to them is crucial. Two, this is the end of his doctrinal section of this letter. Remember, we talked about this in the beginning. Paul often structures his letters in two sections. This is what God has done for you. Therefore, this is what you should do for God. It's not blind obedience. These are the things that God has done for you. And in light of what he has done for you, we should do this for him in response. And that's what he's doing here is reaching the end of that section of this is what God has done for you. This letter is centered on love and unity in the church. This is a church letter. This is about us, us individually and us as a unit, as a chapel of Christian faith. This is instruction, deep theology for us. And so Paul has just explained to them in chapter 2, you'll remember, that God has taken two very dissimilar people, two different groups of people who hated each other, and he has put them together in the same room. What do you think is going to happen? There's going to be a fight, isn't there? There's going to be battles, aren't there? Remember we talked about that? He took the Jews and he took the Gentiles. Jews were the people, they were God's people. And they had God's promises. And they were put into a group with those Gentile dogs. Those people who had no right to God. And God now is going to make them heirs and co-heirs with the Jews. How dare he? I hate those people. Remember we talked about it. That a Jewish woman was not allowed to help a Gentile woman even give birth to a baby because she was bringing in another derelict of a human being. Shouldn't do that. We talked about that the Jews so hated the Gentiles that then when they wanted to go from the southern region of Judea, and they wanted to go up to Galilee. They would not go straight through because they must trample through Gentile land, Samaria. So what did they do? They walked 150 miles out of their way to avoid those Gentile dogs. There's hatred, folks. And God is now making a new group. He's taking the Jews and he's taking the Gentiles, and he's not making the Gentiles Jews, and he's not making the Jews Gentiles, he's making a new group. This is a new organization, it's a new organism, it is called the church. And so Paul, as he's reading through this and thinking through this and writing, he's thinking, no doubt, oh my, this is going to be terrible. There's going to be explosions all over the place. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for this church because the battles are coming. That's why this prayer. You can expect trouble, so he prays. Now, this brings up a couple different questions. One is, is one posture better than another? Notice that he says, I kneel. Well, does that mean that if you're not kneeling, you're not being heard? Is it? Now, you're sitting there thinking, well, no, that's not true. How do you know? Has God told you? Therefore, I kneel. I bow my knees before the Father. Well, what you don't know is that in that day, it was very common for Jews to pray standing up all the time. Standing up, praying to God, head raised, hands out. It was a sign of submissive and being submissive and neediness. And also in that age, they would bow. It was a sign of their submissiveness to God, God's supremacy in their life, and the urgency of God. And no doubt, they would pray while they walked. And so I don't see a preference for a posture of prayer. So does God not hear us if we stand and pray, walk and pray? Because I assume all of you are like me. 
uh, when I'm driving, I'll pray. Uh, before I talk to someone about a difficult subject, you can bet I'm going to pray. I pray before my day begins. I pray throughout my day, whether I'm walking, sitting, eating, no matter what I'm doing, there's prayer going up. Is that wrong? I don't think so. You see, God is not so interested in our position as the, as our, of our body as he is in the leaning of our heart. I'm reminded by the story, you've all heard it, of a little boy, a five-year-old boy that kept taunting his sister to the point he drove his mother bananas and his mother said, that's it, you go over, you sit in the corner. And he went over to the corner, but he refused to sit. And she went over and she pressed him down gently on his shoulders and she said, you sit there. And the little boy looked up at her in defiance and said, yeah, I'm sitting on the outside, but I'm standing up inside. <laughs> Isn't that what we can do with God? We can look like the most pious people while our prayers are scraping the Milky Way and God's saying, I don't hear a word you're saying. You are so filled with yourself. You're so prideful. I don't hear it. What is the leaning of your heart? And so it's not so much the position of my body as it is the position of my heart. Am I truly humbled before God? And if I am, the two should look alike. In other words, why, while we kneel and we bow our heads and we pray in submission, that's an outward sign of what's happening in our hearts. We're humbled because we recognize that we are serving and asking of the Most High God. And we have no right, none whatsoever. You have no right to ask God for anything on your own. But through Jesus Christ, you do. Which brings up the problem. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Or are you going to God on your own saying, I don't need Jesus, I'll just go to God on my own. Well, the doors of heaven are locked up and God does not hear you and he won't pay attention to your prayer. Because you're not a child of God. Well, that makes me mad. Well... God's word. To those who received Christ, he gave them the right to become children of God. If you want God to hear you, there's only one way, and it's through Jesus Christ. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you come to a point in your life where you say, God, I know I've done wrong things. I know I'm not perfect. I'm not as bad as the other guy, but I'm not as good as some. I know that I've done some wrong things. I found out today that I can know I'm going to heaven if I trust in Jesus Christ that he paid for my sins, past, present, and future. And right now, I'm trusting alone in Christ alone. It's not Jesus plus church membership. It's not Jesus plus my prayers. It's not Jesus plus anything. You see, it's Christ alone. And when you trust alone in Christ alone, there should be some fruit. And that's where your works come in. But God hears your prayers because now you're a child of his and he promised to feed you. If you've never done this, today would be a good day to go to God and say, God, I confess I've done a lot of wrong. I'm trusting in Jesus as my Savior. Please save me. And he will. And so it's the attitude of our heart, not the position of our body. We should pray fervently. You see, a fervent prayer comes from, fervent comes from the word in Latin that means to boil. And so as you boil water, it's fervent. So are your prayers more like, well, bless Johnny, bless Bob, bless Donnie, bless the church, bless... Is that your prayers? Is that fervency? Do you even believe it? Or are you just doing it because God told you to? I want you to pray like you really mean it. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to start crying and shouting and screaming for God. No, no, no. God knows your attitude. He, he knows you. He knows who you are. He made you the way you are. And so even though to someone else your prayers may sound rather droll to the person who's very emotional, God understands your prayers are fervent because they're coming through you and you're saying, no, I mean this, God. If you don't do this, 
it won't get done. I'm praying. We need to pray consistently. Now this came up just recently. As you all know, our daughter Megan is getting married in June. And we started this whole process by telling her, Megan, we're okay with you getting married. Nick is a fine young man in every sense of the word. But here's the deal. Once you're married, you're not moving out and he's not moving in. <laughs> That's the reaction she had. So they went looking for an apartment this weekend. Oh, and it's not even close to us. Before they pulled into the parking lot, both Meg and Nick are both in school. You all know that. This is spring break. Nick is in a very difficult course in engineering school, which is not easy. Anybody that's been there knows that. And Megan is in the end of her nursing school. So they wanted a relaxing week. They don't need stress. So they pull into the apartment complex. They go in. And before they go in, Meg looks at Nick. And Nick's like, I just want to take it easy this week. I don't want to make decisions. I just kind of want to look around. I need to just kind of collect myself. And Meg looks at Nick and she goes, I think we need to pray about this. So she bows and he bows in the car before they go in and they both pray. Meg, Meg prays. Nick looks at her and he goes, great. Now this is serious. <laughs> now... Nick said that tongue-in-cheek. He said that with a sense of humor. He was just kidding Meg. But you know, he did not, what he did not realize is that he was depicting the way a lot of Christians live today. You see, we only bother God with the really serious stuff. If I need wisdom, I don't really need that, but you know, if it really means a lot to me, I'm going to pray. Meg represented what God wants. In all things, I pray. Doesn't matter what it is, God, I have this dependence on you. You see, we seem to think that strength is, I don't need anybody. No, that's weakness. Strength is understanding my weakness, that if, God, you don't enter into this, nothing's going to happen. But when you do, all things will happen, not the way I want them, but the way you've designed them. Meg understood strength. And so she prays consistently. So we pray fervently. We pray consistently. We pray regularly. That's what God wants. Do you pray for the same things every day? Well, isn't that vain repetition? I don't think so. Babbling to God is vain repetition. But when you ask him each day, Father, if you don't step into my kid's life, my son's, my daughter's life, their marriage is going to explode. And you pray that every day. It's God like vain repetition, blah, 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 blah. No. No, it's not. It's keeping it before the Father. And it is not vain repetition. It's prayer with purpose. It's prayer that is fervent and consistent and regular. And don't give up. Because when he does it, you're going to know it was him. You're not going to forget. This brings up another question. Who do we pray to? And you're like, oh, who do you think we are? Do you pray to the Father? Do you pray to the Son? Or do you pray to the Holy Spirit? And some of you are thinking, well, all three. All right. Let's go back to the Bible. Who does Paul pray to here? Uh, the Father. See, you're saying, well, wait a second. I understand we have a triune God. There is a trinity, a triune God. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each one is fully God. And so I can pray to the one I want. Well, you're not understanding Scripture. When the disciples said, hey, Jesus, can you teach us how to pray? Yeah, pray this way. Hey, Jesus, who is in heaven? No. Our Father, who art in heaven. We he pray to the Father. Who did Jesus pray to? To the Father. I think we should take his lead. Who did Paul pray to? To the Father. So, what's the deal with this? If each one is fully God, you can pray to whoever you want, right? That's not what Scripture says. Scripture says pray to the Father. Okay, so what are their roles? I want you to think of it this way. While on earth, Jesus always pointed to the Father. After Jesus ascended back to heaven, the Holy Spirit is always shining on Jesus. 
I want you to think of it this way. I want you to picture a statue of Jesus, if you can, in a park, in a park late at night, complete dark. And there in the middle of this park is a statue up on a pedestal, and this statue is doing this. That statue is Jesus. He's pointing to the Father. Okay? That's his role. He glorifies the Father. Now, you can't see this statue at night, so they put a light on it. And this light is a bright light that shines only on Jesus. So everybody can see. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's ministry is to shine on Jesus, to glorify Him, and the Son glorifies the Father. And so I pray to the Father. Now, does that mean I've never said, oh, Holy Spirit, if you don't help me, is that a sin? I don't think so. Uh, is there a case where you could say, well, Lord Jesus, if you don't, is that a problem? Is that a sin? I don't think so. But if we're going to be scriptural, we pray to the Father. We've seen how to tap into that power. But how do we activate it? And it's through fervent prayer. How do we activate it? Well, in verses 16 through 19, we get that. In verses 16 through 19, there's four elements that Paul pulls out. The first one is strengthened through the Spirit, that we praise that they would be strengthened through the Spirit. The second one is that they would be rooted and grounded in love. The third is that they would comprehend the immensity of Christ's love. And fourth, that they would be filled to God's own fullness. Now these four indicate four dimensions of the human life. Strengthened through the Spirit would be psychological part of our lives. Rooted and grounded in love would express our emotional, comprehend the immensity of God's love, cognitive, mental part of our lives. And then the fourth, filled to God's own fullness, would be spiritual. Let's look first at psychological. Strengthen through the Spirit. You see where he says that? Verse 16. That God would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with power. His power. Through His Spirit in the inner man. For decades now, in the sports world, they have a psychology where they teach athletes to envision the game before it starts. And so as a basketball player, he's envisioning himself making the basket. I practiced this even with our son, Sean, when he was, we would practice on our driveway. And he would be shooting baskets, and he missed, and he missed, and he missed. And I'd say, Sean, just stop right there. Hold the ball the way you know. Stand how you know you should stand. And now I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to picture the ball going in. Go ahead. All right, Dad, I got it. Okay. And it would go in almost every time. There's power in that. See, he was tapping into his own abilities. But this psychological part, you're not tapping into your own abilities because they've let you down. When it comes to life, you need more than your abilities. You need God. And so you're tapping in to God. You see, there are times when sermons that focus on feel good and seminars that focus on feel good. Oh, it's great. You're so inspired when you leave, but when life falls apart, that will not get you anywhere. Amen. You need more. You need God. And you need to be able to tap into real power. So Paul is praying for here that you would know that power. Dwell. The word dwell there means not to kind of move in. It means to live there permanently. Allow Christ into your life, but he's going to come in and he wants to go through your house. He doesn't want to come in and just let your, sit in your living room and wait for you to bring him stuff. He wants to go into the attic of your thoughts to see what you've been thinking about. He wants to go through the library of your mind and say, what have you been dwelling on? What do you know? You see, he wants access to the whole house, not just your living room. He wants to dwell permanently. Do you allow him access? 
to all of your life? How would Jesus react if he knew this part about, oh, I didn't want to think about what he might say, and it's ashamed. Let him. Let him in. Let him knock on that door. Let him run through your house and say, what's behind this door in this bedroom here? Can I go in? And what's behind that door? Oh, the basement. I want to see what's in the basement there. I want to see what's in the basement of your memories that you want to hide from everybody. Let me in there. Let me see. You see, he's grace. And he's kind. And he will work. And he will help. Praise God is right. He wants to dwell. And he dwells through faith. Notice, dwell through faith. Not through Bible reading, Bible memorization, prayers, and going to church. All of those things are great things to do. But you see, it's by faith that you must know that you know that you know that Christ is here when I trusted him and when I need him, which is every day. He's right there. I want you to listen to this quote. When Patty and I reached a very difficult time in our lives where we were going to make a step and we knew, oh boy, if this doesn't work out, if we're getting God wrong in this, this is going to be utter failure and we will have a hard time recovering from this. Is when we came across this quote. When, this is faith, when you walk to the edge of all the light you have. Can you picture that? You're walking to the edge, like walking up to a cliff. And you're walking up to the edge of all the light you have. And you take the first step into the darkness of the unknown. You ever been there? Yep. Yeah. You must believe that one of two things will happen. There will be something solid for you to stand upon or you will be taught to fly. <laughs> That's faith. That's faith. That very quote got us off the ground and got us to where we needed to be. And thank God, he's been faithful. You see, faith is not belief without proof. It's trust without reservation. It's not mine. It's good. Faith is not belief without proof, but trust without reservation. It's knowing God so intimately that you know God I know that you will take care of me. I don't know what that looks like, but I know you will. Because he's good. Emotional, that you would be rooted and grounded. Rooted, an example from nature. Most of you know this, that in Psalm 1, verse 3, the psalmist writes in that first psalm, these words, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, and nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, on his word. And in his law he meditates day and night. What does it look like to a man like that? Can you give me a picture? The psalmist gives us a picture. This man who does that is like a tree firmly planted by streams of water. It will yield its fruit in season. That person who walks closely with God is like a tree not in the desert that will wither. It's right by the stream. It gets all the nutrients it needs. And it will bear its fruit in season. It will be fine. You see, rooted. Be rooted in God. And grounded. Uh, grounded like from the world of architecture. Like a building that has a strong foundation and a movable foundation when this happens when you become emotionally unbalanced when divorce shakes the very foundations of your family whether it's yours or your kids you will be emotionally stable when tragedy or death rips through your family like a tornado you will remain emotionally stable because you know who's in charge. You see, you will become an agent of peace and unity and reconciliation even when the world is upside down because you are rooted and grounded in Christ. Do you think a truth like that could change your life? 
Did any wonder why Jesus said, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free? This is why God's word is so important, folks. Now we go to the mental. That you could comprehend the love of God. You see, the love of God can't be completely comprehended. You have to experience it, folks. As Patty and I are going through with Nick and with Megan and taking them through premarital counseling and talking with them, how do you explain to them what 20, 30, 40, 50 years of marriage is going to be like. You know, give us some ABC. Give us some schoolwork on this. Help us to know exactly what it is. Well, we can dissect it and divide it and measure it and try to come up with words to give them, but that would be just like somebody sitting here in the morning in a concert. And you go to a concert, and the conductor stands up, and he says, okay, this is going to be, and he starts talking notes to you and chords and chord progressions oh we're gonna go from this chord and we're gonna go to this chord like this and you're like i don't get it how are you going to get that music you must experience it and when the music fills the room you start to sweat with music because you experience it it's like that with god if you're going to comprehend his love, you must jump in both feet all the way and experience his love on a daily basis. Yeah, we can try to dissect it, measure it, and memorize verses. That's a good start. But you must experience God day to day. That's where you tap into real power. That's when you start pulling the rip cord. That's when you start to understand He says God's love is broad enough to wrap around anyone, anyone. It is high enough to reach through the heavens and beyond. God's love is deep enough to touch any need, and it's long enough to go beyond any barrier. You can't measure God's love. I want you to think of this. Why is this love so important? Why is love so important for you today? Why is it so important? We had a man that uh, moved back north. He was here for decades. He served on our board. His name was Pierce Meck, and he worked for Sikorsky Aviation up in Connecticut. And they brought him in, and they gave him a challenge. They built helicopters, and they said, we have a real problem. We're trying to take two dissimilar service or, uh, pieces of uh, one's metal and the other one's fiber and we're trying to put them together and we can't find anything that will hold these two together. You see, we can hold them together but as soon as we put them under pressure they fly apart. The violence of the pressure comes and they fly apart and destruction is the result. You see, they were trying to come up with a way that they could take the metal blade that came out of the motor and the fan blade on the top of the helicopter and put them together so they wouldn't come apart. They tried bolts, but under the pressure, the holes would just start to wiggle and the nuts would loosen and <laughs> blade would go out, helicopter goes down, utter destruction. He came up being an engineer of adhesives, a special adhesive that would hold them together so they would never come apart and yet remain balanced in everything it did, never shudder, never shake. God needed a special adhesive to hold his church together under pressure so it wouldn't explode. Let me give you another analogy. I often wondered when I, I built models. My brother was a big model builder. So when you have a little model car or airplane, whatever it is you put together, there's model glue. Model glue does not just hold two pieces together. Like many glues, you just put it in between the two and you put them together and the glue just kind of holds them. No, that isn't what model glue does at all. Model glue melts both surfaces. And so it's not sticking on the surface. It melts both surfaces so they're not stuck together. They're melded together. They are welded together. They become a part of one another. That's church. That's you, that's me. 
that special adhesive, it's called love. That's why love is so important. When you see other people just run away from the church or they get mad or they get angry or they don't act in love, something's missing, folks. It's love. Their love, oh no, it's not that. You made me, no, I did not make you mad. You made yourself mad. That was your choice. You love. You see, it's not an option. Didn't Jesus summarize the entire Old Testament with love God, love others? Didn't he give them a new command before he went back or before he went to the cross? A new command to give you love one another? Are you starting to get the message how important love is? Look to your left and to your right. Are you loving those people? Go ahead, look to your left and to your right. Go ahead, I'll wait. I'll be right here when you get back. <laughs> now ask yourself, are you loving that person? And don't look at me and say, but I can't love him. <laughs> you see, love is the agent. Love is the adhesive that holds this church together. It's crucial, folks. Without it, you have something else. You don't have a church. And you don't have a family. And that's why we refer to us as a family. Because the Bible does. Well, who's our daddy? God. God. Fourth one, spiritual. That you would be filled with God's fullness. God's desire is to fill you with his capacity out of his riches, not yours. Heaven cannot, heaven and earth cannot contain God. You know that. Look at 2 Chronicles 6.18. We're not going to go there. Heaven and earth cannot contain God. But how much of God do you have? Now, I know, theologically, when you trust alone in Christ alone, you have all the spirit you're going to get. But the question is, how much of the experience of God do you have? You have all of God you're going to get, but does he have all of you? Or are you reserving parts? If you do, you're not going to experience this love. But most of that is going to be next week in part two. And we're going to talk about that next week. Make sure you come. How are we going to put this into action? We've looked at how to activate it, how to tap into it. How are we going to put this into action that we can experience this grace of God that will utterly transform your life? As a mature Christian, Christians who have lived 50, 60, 70, 80 years in, under Christ, Many don't know these things. Not because they're hidden. But we tend to look at our performance and not his. We tend to depend on ourselves and practice our religion. We talk about Jesus, but we are missing the authority that he gives us and that he wants to display through us. You've heard me say it many times. Christ wants to live his life through you as you. But for many... We're living it on our own. Yeah, we're saved. We're truly saved. That's not the issue here. The issue is, are you a Christian or are you a disciple? Which is it? How do we put this into action? One, claim Christ's power. When you're tired, he's not. Let me read a familiar passage to you. Though youth grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Because the Spirit of God empowers. Not you. The Spirit of God empowers. When we can't, He can. That's number one. Number two, remember that you are deeply loved. I know. There's many times we don't feel worthy. And we're not. But God has dedicated himself to loving us. God gives good gifts. Only good gifts come from him. And knowing that he loves us helps us to accept that silence in times we cry out, God, where are you? And heaven seems shut up to us. We cry out. Love says, I know my daddy loves me. And so I know he's not ignoring me. He's working. He's just not ready to tell me what he's doing yet. And so I keep praying. 
It doesn't mean he doesn't care. It means he's working. Are you his child? He promised to take care of you. Third, rest in him completely. Remember the Apostle Paul? This thorn in the flesh, can't you do something with it, God? This is greatly hindering me. And God said, Paul, don't you understand? I gave you that thorn in your flesh so that you would depend on me. Because when you're working in your own power, you're weak, Paul. As gifted as you are, you are weak. You depend on me. I don't like that, God. Then God said, when you're weak, Paul, then I'm strong. And Paul said, bring it on. Bring it on. Because when I'm weak, I'm strong. Rest in God. Rest in God. Rest in Him. Let's pray. Seal these words to our hearts. Help us to understand, God, your amazing grace that you want to live through us. Help us to pull the ripcord and start the motor and allow you to work in our lives. And when it happens, we'll know. We will know. We will see you working mightily. And we will see fruit of the Spirit. Father, my brothers and sisters here love you. Now take your word and seal it to them. I want them to experience this kind of power. In Jesus' name, amen. Please pray with me. Father, I ask that you would seal your word to our hearts. That we don't leave here and flush it. Help us, Father, to meditate on it. For your words are life. The truth sets us free. And Father, I want that for my brothers and sisters. And I want it. Big time. Help us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.